this case, G was left out. Let's discuss a real-life example of paraphyletic group and consider this phylogenetic tree containing the following taxa. Birds, dinosaurs, crocodiles, snakes, lizards, turtles, mammals, and amphibians. The taxonomic group reptiles contains dinosaurs, crocodiles, snakes, lizards, and turtles, and it actually does not include the birds. So, this would constitute reptiles to be a paraphyletic group. Why? This is because the common ancestor that unites all the reptiles is also an ancestor of the birds. So, why don't we consider birds to be reptiles? While all the reptiles resemble each other quite closely, birds are actually quite different. They have rapidly acquired many characteristics that differentiate them from the reptiles. Thus, they are not included in the grouping reptiles. And because we don't consider birds to be reptiles, the group reptiles is actually a paraphyletic group. Because of its exclusion of birds, reptiles is actually no longer considered to be a meaningful taxonomic grouping. Another type of incorrect grouping is polyphyletic groups. A polyphyletic group has at least two separate evolutionary origins. It includes organisms that are not related or those that are only distantly related to the rest of the group. In this phylogenetic tree, suppose we classify D, E, F, G, and H to be part of a group. Although we have correctly identified D, E, and F, and G to be closely related, we have incorrectly included species H in the same group, because it does not come from the same common ancestor. This would create a polyphyletic group, because species H, although it was not a descendant of the common ancestor, was included in the group. So now you can ask again. Why was species H even included in the group in the first place? It is possible that species H resembled species D, E, F, and G in many characteristics, and because of that, we mistakenly assumed that this resemblance was due to common descent when it actually was not. As we see in the phylogenetic tree, species H is actually only distantly related to the species D, E, F, and G, as indicated by the dotted lines at the bottom. The dotted lines at the base of the phylogenetic tree indicate a distant past. So, any resemblance between the species D, E, F, G and species H is actually due to convergent evolution, as we discussed earlier. Again, remember Darwin's second big idea, because of which organisms that are only distantly related may appear to be similar, which could be why species H was incorrectly included in this group. Polyphyletic groups are not a monophyletic group because they include descendants that are not related or those that are only distantly related to the rest of the group. A real-life example of a polyphyletic group would include the birds and the bats, which are often classified together as the living, flying vertebrates. Due to similar environmental pressures, both birds and bats have solved the problem of harnessing aerodynamics in the same way, by evolving wings. However, wings have evolved in both birds and bats separately. They have not been inherited from a common ancestor. And so here, we see a case of convergent evolution. So, here's a recap of the three types of groupings possible. First, we have monophyletic groups which contain all the descendants of a common ancestor. Secondly, we have paraphyletic groups. These groups contain some, but not all of the descendants of a common ancestor. Sometimes, closely related organisms may differ a great deal, leading us to exclude them from the group, which can lead to the construction of paraphyletic groups. And thirdly, we have polyphyletic groups, Polyphyletic groups include taxa whose ancestor does not belong to the group. These groups have at least two separate evolutionary origins, and they can be thought of as a random assortment of species. 
In this case, organisms that appear very similar may only be distantly related. However, we can actually incorrectly classify them into the same group due to their superficial similarities. However, these similarities can occur due to convergent evolution, which can lead to the construction of polyphyletic groups. So, only characters that are shared by descent or a common ancestry can help us to reconstruct evolutionary relationships, which is what we try to do when we are constructing phylogenies. Only monophyletic groups or clades are true representations of the evolutionary relationships in a phylogeny. And for this reason, only monophyletic groups can be used to construct phylogenetic trees. Both paraphyletic and polyphyletic groupings are mistakes that we try to avoid. Now that we have determined the three types of groupings possible in phylogenetic analysis, which are monophyletic, paraphyletic, and polyphyletic, let's discuss the types of characters or characteristics of the organisms themselves. There are two main types of characters, analogous characters and homologous characters. Homologous characters can be further subdivided into simplesiomorphies and synapomorphies. We will discuss each of these in detail. Let's first discuss analogous characters. An analogy or analogous character is a character that is found in two or more taxa that evolved independently in each lineage. Analogous characters are not inherited from a common ancestor. In other words, analogies are characters that are functionally similar, but which are acquired independently in different lineages through convergent evolution. An analogy is also known as a homoplasy. Now, let's discuss homologous characters. A homology or homologous character is a character that is shared by two or more taxa because it was inherited from a common ancestor. Homologous characters are characters that are shared through descent. As stated earlier, homologies can be further subdivided into simplesiomorphies, which are ancestral homologies, or synapomorphies, which are derived homologies. Let's first discuss simplesiomorphies, which are also known as ancestral traits. A simplesiomorphy is a shared ancestral character that has been inherited from a distant ancestor and that which has remained relatively unchanged over time. And now, let's discuss synapomorphies, which are known as derived traits. A synapomorphy is a shared derived character which has been inherited from a recent ancestor and that which has changed from the ancestral form. Simplesiomorphies are often not found in all descendants. Thus, simplesiomorphies are not reliable indicators of shared ancestry, and so, they are not useful in constructing phylogenies. Synapomorphies, on the other hand, are usually found in all descendants. So, they are reliable indicators of shared ancestry, and they are useful in constructing phylogenies. Here's a summary table reiterating some of the points discussed about both simplesiomorphies and synapomorphies. Feel free to review this table in your own time. Just to clarify some vocabulary, simplesiomorphies are shared ancestral traits. We refer to a trait as a simplesiomorphy when it is shared between two or more organisms. A plesiomorphy is just an ancestral trait, so we refer to a trait as a plesiomorphy when we are talking about the trait in just one organism alone. Similarly, synapomorphies are shared drive traits, so we refer to a trait as a synapomorphy when it is shared between two or more organisms. Anapomorphy is just a derived trait, 
So we refer to a trait as an apomorphy when we are talking about the trait in just one organism.